Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on Arc's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements. Welcome, Harry Sloan and Eli Baker to the For Your Innovation podcast. Uh, why don't you take a second to introduce yourselves and introduce Eagle Equity Partners? How did you get into the SPAC business? Okay, hi, Brett. Um, how do we get in the SPAC business? I was running MGM Studios in 2010, and, and Jeff Zagansky, longtime friend, calls me up and says, hey, there's this, there's this new... Uh, device on Wall Street where you can raise money on your good looks in a public company and uh, and then buy something. And I was in the middle of a private equity, a company controlled by private equity, which wasn't a lot of fun, wanted to at some point, you know, get involved with another company, um, love the public markets and this idea that you could raise money, you know, in the, in the public markets in a shell and then buy something sounded too good to be true. And it turned out you actually can raise money, not on your good looks, but on your track record. So, you know, we go back a decade. Jeff and I did that back in 2011. Uh, we now have done seven uh, SPACs. We haven't completed the seventh one. We just raised it last week. Eli Baker, who's with me, can introduce himself, but he joined us in 2014, which uh, I think has been a, a, an important milestone for us because Eli is our president and uh, third partner. I like to tell this one story that I've, I've told before, which is that so I knew, I knew Jeff um, for a long time, Harry for less, and Jeff comes to me one day after Harry and he had launched their first SPAC and it was out looking for its first target, and he said, I've got this great new thing, and you, you should know Jeff because he gets very excited about stuff, and he, said, and he said, I've got this great new thing called a SPAC. I said, a SPAC? Well, what's that? Kind of like you did, Brett, and he explained it to me, and I said, I don't understand it. Explain it to me again, and he explained it to me again, and I still didn't understand it. <laughs> and fast forward now, you know, several, seven years later or so, you know, here we are. So maybe that's a great lead in for your audience. Yeah. So what is a SPAC? What's the, now that you have learned over seven years, hopefully, exactly what one is, help me understand because it seems kind of like an IPO, but kind of not. Harry, you want? No, go ahead. Yeah. So it, yeah, it, because you still never admitted that you actually found out what a SPAC was. So now we're going to find out. Well, I think that's, I think it's a fair accusation. Let, let's see right now. Now's the test. No, I think the best way is kind of like you described it is, is a SPAC is what we call, and sometimes we, we speak about this very specifically. It's an alternate way of becoming public. It's an alternate IPO. And we'll get into like the differences between a regular way IQ, IPO or a traditional IPO and a SPAC IPO. But what it is technically, it is a public company through, through a company that Harry and I and Jeff, you know, take public that acquires a third party operating business and takes that company public via that acquisition transaction. But what it really is doing at its heart is taking a company, a real operating business public through a different means because of a number of built in advantages. And there's a lot of good that comes from it. And that's kind of opening the market's eyes right now. And there's also some parts that are bad, but we'll get into all that. Yeah, it also permits, you know, guys like us who actually want to be involved sometimes in the operations of a business to get involved with a company without having to, you know, run it full time, without having to put up only our own money to be able to test whether you can also bring in investors and then have some degree of involvement going forward. I mean, we were, we differentiated ourselves in the beginning. Uh, I'm talking 2011, we created our first SPAC. We differentiated ourselves in the beginning by saying we're media, entertainment, digital media guys, and uh, everybody else were financial guys doing SPACs. So we were the first ones to say, look, we're, we're looking for targets. The market is not all that excited about traditional, what was considered traditional media in the U.S., but if you could find a, a traditional media like a satellite TV or cable in a high growth market, that would be a good IPO. If it's in the U.S. market, it should be a digital media company. And in fact, our first two SPACs, First one was digital media. It was Wi-Fi to the airlines 10 years ago, a company called Global Eagle. And then our second one actually was traditional media, satellite TV, but in India, in a high growth market. So, you know, we began by saying we're looking for particular kind of targets. It's within our expertise. 
Jeff had run media companies. He ran the CBS network before Les Moonves. He ran Sony. I was running MGM at the time before that SBS broadcasting. And we also could say, look, this was 10 years ago. I think maybe we're not in this position necessarily now, but we could say, look, if for some reason something doesn't work, we could actually step in and run the company. What's interesting is when we started this 10 years ago, and we'll talk a lot about you know where it came from to where it is today, right? which has made the likes of you guys and ARC invested in, in looking at SPACs and understanding them. But we used to say, unless a company has hair on it, it's probably not going to be interested in a SPAC. Right? Either they would look for a private transaction right, with private equity or raise money the private way, or it would do a regular way IPO. And we had a big burden, which we talk about a lot, of to try to convince you know, owners or founders or executives to try to go public with a SPAC. And that's really only changed in the last, I don't know, 12 months, right? Harry, I mean, really since DraftKings, has that phenomenon changed and people took notice? It, well, it's changed, but, but I think there's less than meets the eye here because in those days, you know, a company who, as Eli said, had hair on it, couldn't go public the regular way, would look for a SPAC. And therefore, SPAC promoters, SPAC sponsors had a, you know, subject not a great reputation, although I thought we did because we'd run successful companies. My last two public companies' stocks had performed really well. SBS Broadcasting was like a 30 40% IRR for 10 years and before that, New World. So we were maybe a little different in that we weren't looked on as sort of the last resort for an IPO. We took a different tack. We said companies that should go public or can go public the regular way probably should, and we should look for companies that had a reason to use a SPAC. So for example, the first deal we did, which was uh, Wi-Fi to the airlines, it was cool. It was a good subject for an IPO. It was a brand new area, but we were acquiring two companies at the same time. We were acquiring a company that was a satellite company, uh, which uh, created the Wi-Fi technology to deliver Wi-Fi to airlines via satellite, antenna on top so you could fly over water. But we also were combining content with distribution, which is the oldest story in media. You want both the content and the distribution. So we bought the company that controlled all the movies that had deals with all the studios that controlled the movies and the television shows to, from the networks and from the studios. And we acquired the company that had the distribution capability of satellite. Anyway, you put them together. You cannot do a regular way IPO with two companies. You can't take two companies public at the same time because if, in order to do that, you'd have to have consolidated financials and that the investors want to see synergies. They're skeptical. So you have to show some operating. Anyway, you can't take two companies public at the same time. But with a SPAC, because a SPAC already is public, you're simply acquiring two companies. It's a merger. And that's what happened with DraftKings, by the way. DraftKings couldn't go public the regular way because DraftKings' strategy was to merge with their tech supplier, SP Tech. So what happened was they both merged into a SPAC. We, Diamond Eagle, acquired DraftKings and SB Tech when the deal closed, and the rest is history. So DraftKings was basically another, our fifth SPAC was a repeat of the first SPAC. But that's why the Global Eagle Company had to use a SPAC. The second one, Satellite TV in India, and I'll wrap this up really quickly. They had, Satellite TV runs negative cash flow for a long, long, long time, as you guys know. So they had 500 million in debt they needed to pay down. In the Indian market, the liquidity wasn't such that they could raise more than 100. So they had to be in the U.S. market, but nobody knew them in the U.S. market. Whereas Jeff and I were successful media guys, we got in front of this thing and we had a $325 million SPAC. We were able to take an Indian satellite TV company public in the U.S. through a SPAC, couldn't have gone regular way. So in those days, it was clear to us that we were only going to do SPACs with companies that, uh, that, that couldn't or shouldn't go regular way. But now things seem to have changed. Yeah, this is where I disagree with, with what you're seeing right now. What you're seeing right now is 70%, and I think it's even getting higher. We were talking to NASDAQ the other day, and we said we heard 50% of the IPOs this year were specs. No, 70% going higher. So the view out there is there's no difference. The SPAC is an absolute superior way. It's faster. You can give longer-term projections. You can have private meetings. It's just clearly better. We're contrarian on that. We, we, we do not think that every regular way IPO deal is better off going SPAC. Why is this happening now? I mean, this you were in kind of like a esoteric corner of the capital markets for a little while, and special purpose acquisition companies existed before you existed, right? And suddenly, 70% of IPOs are SPACs. 
what is the catalyzing event that, that led to all this? Or is it just kind of the contingent path of history? I think there are two things. The first is, is I think in a previous conversation, I said this, this idea that the concept is, let's take all the IPOs out there and say that SPACs are 70% of the IPOs is really an incorrect comparison, right? SPACs, when they're IPO'd, like when Harry and I just raised our last, uh, you know, our last SPAC, which is, you know, Soaring Eagle, that's just the IPO. We have not found a target business. We don't have an operating business. The real comparison between regular way IPOs and the SPAC version of an IPO is really the, it was when they close a business combination. It's, for example, when we closed DraftKings in 2020, when we closed Skills in 2020. That's the comparison of the total amount of public offerings of new public companies. So that's one thing that the market, and I think a lot of publications, pick up quickly is they say, oh my God, all these IPOs are all the same. Well, it's not, right? SPACs are just raised funds looking for that deal. So that's number one. What changed, right, in 2020, the last, really the last 12 months, I think? Because I think it really happened with DraftKings, with Virgin Galactic. And I think that there's kind of a bigger trend out there too that's, that's even beyond SPACs. And I think SPACs are just the conduit for companies going public earlier. Because I think what's been happening is the most attractive place to invest for the last 10 years are these late stage, especially tech companies, but these companies that have stayed private longer and longer than they ever had in the past, and the fact that there's less opportunities to invest in the public markets than there ever were. I think the actual listings, around 50% of total public listings on NASDAQ and NYSE than there were, I think, 10 years ago. And I think investors have been kind of starved, frankly, for those opportunities to invest in those companies because those companies have been the domain of the private equity guys, the venture guys, the late stage guys, and I think after a couple of examples like DraftKings, like Virgin Galactic, and a handful of others, I think it woke the market up to opportunities to take those companies public at an earlier stage than they otherwise would because of some of the built-in uh, advantages, especially the likes of giving forward-going projections. That's, that's really what's changed here. There's a lot of a lot to unpack here. I just want to, so, so that our audience has a good bearings here, can we dig into the basic components of taking, you know, going, going IPO via a SPAC? You know, we talked about kind of the initial IPO proceeds getting raised, and then you have the period where you go out and search companies, and then there's the pipe and de -SPAC. And Can you kind of just walk us through what each of those are and what does it mean to actually become public via the SPAC? Sure. Um, so it's, I think you have it mostly right. So let's take it step by step. So at the first stage, it's the sponsor. So in our case, that's that's Harry, myself, and, and Jeff. Um, in our case, is our firm promotes by launching a new SPAC, which is technically launching a new fund. Or sorry, technically it's actually taking a company public, but we think of it as launching a new fund. So we technically raise an IPO, whether on NASDAQ or NYC, and we've done both. Our most recent one is with NASDAQ. And we file a form S1, just like any company would do. Facebook did the same thing, Netflix did the same thing, on and on, although it's a little hard to believe it's exactly the same form, and that we launch that IPO. We literally go, although not right now, but typically we've gone on, on a road show in Midtown of Manhattan where there's a black car that drives the three of us around and we sit in front of investors and tell them what we're gonna invest in or what our thesis might be, and we raise the money that way. Then they put in for their indications, just like in a regular way IPO, and we decide to raise however much money we think that we should raise, whether it's 300 million, 500 billion, million, or well over a billion, which is our latest offering. Once we close that process, we are publicly traded, right? Which in a SPAC is comprised of units, right? And which is comprised of shares and warrants. And we have a 24 month period with a couple of exceptions, 24 month period to go and start part two, which is finding that business combination target, right? Finding that operating business that we think will make a great public company. And so that requires a lot of work from the sponsor. That's really where the magic is, which is we are, we are leveraging our connections. We are leveraging our board members' connections if we have a strong board, which we like to think that we do. And we like to leverage, obviously, our relationships with our bankers. You know, Goldman Sachs has been our banker on this last uh, transaction. We've been partners with Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, on and on and on. And we try to find the best possible company in a short period of time because, don't forget, we are effectively holding money from public investors, most of them institutional, who have a time value of money attached to it. They want us to come back with the best possible deal as quickly as we can, and that's our, that's our, rot, that's our job, right? That's our role and responsibility for them. Once we do find that, find that company, right, 
Harry, Jeff, and I, we, we have a sponsor that negotiates you know, a deal, basically, formulating mostly around valuation, although there's other key parts of the transaction too, including, as you mentioned before, Elon, is you know, how the pipe might fit into this. And we negotiate that framework, and then we bring that to the market in two different pieces. And I'll let Harry talk a little about the pipe process, because that's an evolving thing and more specific. But we bring that to the market through, eventually, what's a form S4, which is acquisition of one company of another, but really is an IPO because we're more or less an empty shell, right? Uh, the SPAC is, and the real operating business that investors want to look at is, is the operating company, is the target business. And once we do bring that to market and we announce the transaction, then investors get the opportunity before the SEC has completely cleared us to invest in the pro forma, the going forward public company, right? So let's take DraftKings as an example. We announced the merger of DraftKings and SB Tech and Diamond Eagle, right, all at once. And investors, if they like that opportunity, they get to invest in that company by buying our stock, which in that case was Diamond Eagle, which trades as a proxy for the deal once it gets through the SEC process and it's completely closed. And once we get through that SEC process, we have you know, a, redemption, a redemption date, which we can talk about a little bit, which is a technical issue, and a shareholder vote, right? which I think any M large M&A transaction would, would have. And then it becomes a standalone business as if it was a regular way IPO, and DraftKings or Skills just goes on its way and performs in the public markets. And that's more or less how it works. All right, talk about the pipe, Harry. <laughs> okay. And then I'll circle back to a couple of Eli's plots. The pipe has become, you know, the replacement of what used to be the roadshow on a regular way IPO. You know, the pipe is the process where two things happen. One is you find out what the investors really think of the deal and what they really think of the valuation because the investors in the SPAC are just sitting there with a free option. Deal's been announced. They can watch, you know, how it trades. And if it trades up, you know, then they think it's a good deal and uh, maybe they stay in and take the stock because they can redeem, but they redeem at 10 bucks, they don't make any money. The pipe has actually had a very positive effect. The pipe is the way that you go out to investors who sign a confidentiality agreement before you announce the deal. Because when you announce the deal, you want to have the pipe investors in place. The pipe investors traditionally were investors who were not part of the SPAC itself. The SPAC itself was primarily hedge funds. In the old days, it was primarily ARBs. But you wanted to get the big mutual funds, Capital Groups, Wellington, Franklin, T. Rowe, you want to get them engaged and they're not, hadn't been SPAC investors. And you want to get them in, invested because with all due respect to the hedge funds, they've got the better analysts, they've got more analysts, they've got more specific analysts. On skills, there were two or three gaming analysts at Fidelity who met with us before they came in on the pipe, for example. That's where you find you know, these big teams. So you're getting a credible look by analysts who are specific to that business, whether it was gaming in the case of DraftKings, whether it was mobile gaming in the case of skills. So it's a, a way to confirm the valuation because you're asking people to commit that when the deal closes, they will buy a certain amount of stock at par. So two things happen. You are, number one, confirming the validation, uh, confirming the valuation and validating the valuation with the, the best investors who can buy more stock and who are not looking for you know, a quick turnover. And number two, you're raising money. So oftentimes, they'll have a $500 million SPAC, but the company will need 600 700 or 800 The pipe then fills that gap. Uh, so that, that's the purpose of the pipe process. And when we started, the pipe was just what I said. Since then, the pipe has become almost mandatory because the street and the analysts on all sides are realizing that the SPAC investors alone, they're playing momentum sometimes. They're playing what's the reputation of the sponsor. They're not really digging into the company. It's the pipe investors who are digging in for two reasons. They don't have a free option, right? They can't just redeem. When they sign their pipe agreement, they are committed to buy stock. So anyway, that's now always being done. And it's created a, a pipe bubble, actually, where <laughs> you know people are dying to get into pipes. And the, and the Reddit investors, and you know those guys are getting into pipes as well. And it's taking on a life of its own, which is not good, because now it's attracted the speculators. And the speculators are the problem in, in the whole market right now. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. Harry, Harry said it right. What, what is a pipe? It has become the new IPO allocation, right? 
where investors, I mean, the biggest institutional investors are tripping over each other. And I'm sure you've recognized a little bit of the same, you know, at ARC, where they are trying as hard as they can to be in that position to be able to get their allocation, especially if there's higher and higher and higher quality deals, you know, that are coming through the process. And so when Harry mentions this SPAC bubble, um, what I think he what I think he really means is that there is now just like in a really high IPO, you know, investors are climbing over to themselves to get it, and so people are over allocating and indicating for huge amounts because of the scarcity value, because there may not that be that much pipe to go around. Well, what's the typical lockup period, or is that negotiable? I thought I remember it's pretty long, but for who? Uh, about uh, for, well, for for, for pipe for, investors, there's no lockup. One, long. one of the advantages of the pipe is it's freely tradable, so. These guys will commit to buy, you know, pipe shares at 10. The stock will trade up. The first time we ever saw um, pipe investors having committed to buy stock at a higher price was on Churchill 4, which was lucid. The, based on crazy speculation, the, without even a deal being announced, the stock was trading at 50 or 60 when it should have been 11, as all SPACs should probably trade. But on, on the speculation, the craziness, about lucid deal, it was trading up at 60. So the idea of selling pipe at 10, they actually sold the pipe at 15, but there is no lockup on the pipe. And that's one of the, gotta be one of the concerns. When pipe was, when the game was being played straight with pipe, when pipe was there for the big mutual fund investors who don't invest in SPACs because it's either not in their charter or for whatever reason, and a way to get them in and the way to get two or three serious analysts at Capital Group or T Row or Fidelity or somewhere, to look at the product, which by the way, one of the advantages we have is we have these relationships with the analysts and that matters to us, the buy side analysts. And with guys like you, for example. The one important difference in a pipe, and right, and this is technical, but really important is that, um, like I said in the beginning, is that once you announce a transaction, the SPAC stock becomes a proxy for the deal, right? Investors like it, it's gonna go up from $10 because that's the price at which you transact. Um, if they don't, it's going to stay at ten dollars because that's the cash you know that 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 a SPAC sponsor has in trust. But a pipe, when you get that commitment, right? This is why usually it had been like the T rows and the Fidelities and the capital groups are the ones who were entering in it. It's a three month kind of illiquid, so it's not a lockup, but it's an illiquid commitment. They don't have to fund it right away, but they're signing a contract to say that they're going to fund at the close of the transaction. So typically, only really fundamental guys would be taking that three month illiquid market risk. Big market risk. I mean, what if you had a situation like March where the whole market dropped 30 or 40 percent, which was the case in the DraftKings pipe. We announced the DraftKings pipe in December of 19, and that was a perfect pipe. It had Capital Group, it had Wellington, it had Fidelity. Sorry, it didn't have Fidelity. It had Franklin Fund, it had Bain. It had people that are not SPAC investors, but people who gave it credibility. And I think one of the reasons the stock traded up to 11, 12, 13 in December of 19 was the quality of the pipe investors. But those people, those pipe investors sat on, I think our pipe was 300 million, 300 million of commitments from December until we closed mid-April. Guess what happened in March, right? The market dropped 25, 30%, looked like it was maybe headed for 50%. And by the way, not one of those guys called us to try to get out of the pipe, which obviously was a good thing. But with DraftKings, it got held up because the SEC was wondering, here's a company which whose business is betting on sports and sports were all shut down. The SEC itself was basically shut down working out of their house. It was a rare, very, very rough time. So I do have some sympathy, you long to sort of go all the way back with people who do sign up on these pipe commitments, why they may be entitled to instant liquidity. Just like framing the way in which the market is working, it kind of seems as if the SPAC sponsors are basically gig economy IPO bankers for the investment banks, right? <laughs> yeah, like, well, like this is yeah. the Uber of IPOing, <laughs> right? And you, and you are the Uber drivers driving around with your money. You need to find a company that you're going to IPO, and <laughs> and uh, and and so that's it's like you have taken the IPO franchises and split yeah. them into however many different SPAC sponsors there are who are all yeah. running around trying to put together deals. Uh, well, look, the so analogy I used that the pipe, which is part of SPAC world, is the roadshow. That is what used to be the roadshow. Okay. Now, it's worse than that, though, because with Uber, you don't pay until you've had, actually had the ride. Your example, we are paying 2% up front to the banks for raising, in our case, a billion seven fifty, and in many cases, 500 million. I mean, those are real fees. So it's a bit of an AUM game for the SPAC sponsors 
but it's also a volume game for the banks to see how much SPAC money they can get involved with because that will maybe determine where they're going to stand in the league tables, not on SPAC, but on IPO itself because the IPOs are going to come to the SPAC. So yeah, it's a uh, it, it is it is it's an Uber driver, but you're paying two percent before he gets there. And Brent, I got to commend you because that is the first time I've heard the Uber analogy to the SPAC world. So that that's pretty creative. But I, I know we're going to get to this at some point. But you know, I was just thinking about your analogy because first time I heard it, which is that I mean, if if the SPAC market is this Uber analogy, I guess you got to think about what's really important, and you got to think about who's driving you, right? <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty lousy Uber drivers. <laughs> and so you got to be careful who's your, who you're letting drive the car. <laughs> Use Tesla. <laughs> you know, Brett, you're actually getting close uh, to something that, you know, which is this is becoming an AUM game, right? And, and that's not good. I'll tell you why. When we announced the skills deal, which was our next SPAC deal after DraftKings in September of last year, Okay, the stock traded up right away on the announcement, and I'll, and most SPAC sponsors in that case think, okay, deal's been announced, let's move on. We view that as the first inning. So after we, because we think there's so much more to do to try to do a good job on the SPAC we just announced, but pretty much everyone else then raises SPAC number two, three, four, or five. As soon as, with all due respect, Chamath, you know, announces a deal, he raises three more. Michael Klein, as soon as he announces a billion dollars, raises a two billion, three of them, four of them, you know, more power to them. They're making money for their investors. And that's fine to just raise that IUM and get as much as you can. And maybe it's being pushed by the banks as much as those SPAC players. But we see it differently. We want to know what happened to try and do a good job on the deal you just announced. And we think that's where the work begins. Because going back to one of the other themes, we want to take public companies that shouldn't obviously go regular way IPO. And for us, those are new companies. Those are companies that don't have, have a comps. There was no comp for DraftKings. It was the only pure play, pure play, sports betting in the U.S., period. No comps. So it takes time and it takes meetings. And yet you have a story to sell. And you have a story to sell about how fast are 50 different states going to adopt sports betting. You need time. You need meetings. You need confidentiality. You need... Same thing with skills. Skills, no one ever heard of that name. It wasn't a brand name. It's not a consumer name. We had to have 150 investor meetings. We had to deal with them to help them put together a board because it was only private equity, private venture guys on the board. They needed a public board. We had to meet with many analysts. We got to know you guys. There's a lot of work to do. It's not an AUM game. It wasn't until skills closed and that money was spent in December that we announced and filed and raised our next fund. So that's us. That's one of the ways we differentiate ourselves. The other way is, is with regard to size and reputation. But putting us aside, you're absolutely right. It's a big AUM game. The banks are you know, complicit in it. And, uh, and the SPAC sponsors, maybe that's just what they want to do for the rest of their career. And therefore, keep raising them. And that's why it's $160 billion so far this year or whatever it is. I guess you could you could think about it like you as the SPAC sponsor, you have to go to a company that you're trying to merge into the public markets and convince them that you're a good enough operator to merge with. How like it sounds like you've just given me some of your pitch about how you differentiate yourself, right? It, the the other side pitch might be, well, everybody knows me because I've done 25 SPACs, right? And even though I kind of do call it a shoddy job on those, I have a big enough name and maybe I'm a big enough celebrity that I can basically attract liquidity to those SPACs when I identify a merger target. And because people know me, they come to me and like, hey, do you want to take my company public? Is that, that the look, kind of thing you're competing it's, against? It's absolutely fair. And we may be competing and not, we may not be competing because if these other SPAC sponsors believe they've got the bandwidth, to see through the deal that they just announced and raise three more and be looking for deals and meet their fiduciary obligations to all of those investors to do all of that, good. Maybe they can. Maybe they've got a big enough team. And if the track record speaks for itself and investors won't play if they don't do well, that's fine. We're just different. And our presentation to a company is more of this one at a time. We are going to be involved with the company 
make sure the deal closes. If it doesn't close, it's no good for anyone. And even beyond that, we're still on the boards of all the companies. I'm, I'm lead director, uh, vice chairman of DraftKings today, and, and I'm the main outside director on stills. I'm recruiting new board members. So we're different. We differentiate ourselves that way, and we also differentiate ourselves uh, with regard to size. But again, we differentiate ourselves to get the get the attention of the of the, of the I hate the word target, but the company that you're merging with and you're despacking. I just want to double click on on this thread a little bit. Um, so maybe walk us through just so that our audience has an idea. You know, when you after you raise that initial spec, what kind of work do you go through? How many companies do you meet with? You know, how long did it take you for those your you know your prior DraftKings skills and and your prior spacs? How long did it take to to find a target, right? And what kind of work do you actually do in terms of diligence on these operating companies? So that you get comfortable with it. Well, we we also think this is another you know area of differentiation. And by the way, the differentiation wasn't so important when there were 20 SPACs. Now there's 586 SPACs. Many of them are very good sponsors. Many of them have more expertise than we do in certain areas. So we do need to differentiate ourselves. And one of the ways you long is we've been around 11 years, and 90% of the SPACs are first-time issuers, haven't done a deal yet. And you, they only came up in the last year. They moved from a different industry. How does that help? DraftKings is the most successful SPAC of all time. The stock is trading almost 70 bucks, 68 bucks from 10 in the last year. And it hasn't been one of those stocks that's been 100 and then 20. And it's been a very steady, good stock. You could argue it's the most successful SPAC. May have even started the SPAC bubble if there is one. We, we knew the DraftKings uh, CEO, founder, and board for four years. The SPAC that took DraftKings public was the third SPAC we had an NDA. We really got to know them, which is why you know it happened fairly quickly. But it didn't happen as quickly to answer your question as you think, because it was the third SPAC, um, the skills. Eli and I met them three and a half years ago. We met with them every year. We take the areas we're interested in, which is tech and gaming and enablement and so on, and we get to know these companies. And the companies we're meeting now on the Soaring Eagle, yes, we'll take one of them public, but the other ones we'll continue to keep an eye on. So there's no easy answer to how long it takes. But it's certainly, in our case, on our seventh SPAC over 11 years, it starts when we first met the company. We're meeting somebody today that we've been talking to for years and years and years. And we try to know the people that are in our areas that we you know, specialize in. Eli, maybe you want to add some. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I like using the word cumulative, right? Being a SPAC sponsor is cumulative, right? The longer that you're out there, the more, you know, relationships you have, the more companies that you've talked to. And we met, you know, Andrew Paradise is a great example. And I know, you know, the skill story is that when we met Andrew, you know, the company was substantially smaller than it is today, right? And we, we loved the business. We were super interested in it, but it certainly wasn't ready to go public. And, you know, we stayed close to Andrew for a variety of different reasons and ideas. And finally, you know, it was. And, you know, it's probably not dissimilar to you guys as investors. You look for a company and you maybe you like it, but you don't get there until your next fund or you get there three years later. For whatever reason, it becomes interesting to you. So I, I think that makes a, a big difference. And, and what we really like about that, and, you know, no promise every time that every deal we bring is going to be somebody we've known for three years. But the idea, because you were asked about, one of the two of you guys asked about diligence, it really gives us confidence. And I think also to our investors who know us, when we've talked to guys and knew about their business for three years, it's much better than knowing somebody for 30 days. And we got to know, you know, whether or not these are guys that are overly optimistic in their projections or not. You know, a lot of people in the private market basically just overemphasize all the time. That's how the private market raises money. Doesn't make them a bad guy. That's what you do in the private market. In the case of skills, Andrew Paradise showed us numbers every year and then beat them. You know, I, I mean, I saw yesterday the Wolf Pack or one of these short, you know, uh, a con artist, you know, put, put out a report on skip, put, put on a report on skills. They'd never met anybody. We've known these guys for three and a half years. They want to, you know, come out and say what they think in numbers. Okay, it's a free world. But if we come out and say what we think about numbers and we're wrong, like what I just said, I just said, you know, these are guys who make their numbers. We've seen it over and over. We said that on the road show and we're wrong. We'll never raise another SPAC. So it's a very high responsibility and one way to meet it is to really get to know the players before you take them public. But I, I have a question about that because, you know, 
Eli, you alluded to it that the ability to do longer term projections is, is helpful in terms of bringing some of these companies public, which seems to be the case for us looking at companies, you know, publicly traded companies that have been around, they'll put out an analyst day and they'll lay out their guidance for what they think they're going to do over the next three or five years. Typically, kind of the discipline of the public markets, or maybe it's the discipline of the CFOs and the senior, the tenure of the CFOs in those positions is that guidance is, is actually probably sandbagged to some degree. Like they're trying to lay out something that they can beat. It's clear to us in due diligence in a lot of different SPACs, and it's not uniform. Some of them, we think the, the assessments are reasonable and some are on their face, we think not at all reasonable. Like, why is there much less discipline in that? Or do you disagree with that, that there's much less discipline? And then what is the constraining set of factors that means a publicly traded company that's been around, their, their projections over the medium term are quite reasonable, whereas the Amongst the set of SPACs, there's a lot of projections that seem to be not underwritable from our perspective as forecasters. I think you're lasering in on really with one of the downsides of SPACs that's materialized, right? And I think this is largely due to the proliferation of hundreds and hundreds of SPACs and very eager maybe companies that are too early in the process. And we'll talk about what is too early, which is a whole, I think, subject in its own right um, and a big part of what's going on right now is that I think that matters a lot and that's one of the danger areas for you know for investors. And by the way, for SPAC sponsors too, which is for a regular way IPO, they are very limited in putting out forward guidance or forward projections, right? Which is one of the big advantages of why SPACs are appealing to these kind of later stage but not fully mature companies, right? So they have the ability to tell that story, to give the, the hope and the promise story to investors, which investors wanna hear and they like to look at. And by the way, the private market guys get to hear that all the time. The problem is, is once you're public, you got to live with it. You got to earn it. <laughs> you got to hit your numbers and you can't screw up. And if you miss it, you're in the penalty box. And go back to what I said about no comps. If you're bringing a new company, which is a good reason to do a SPAC, it's got no comps. You need to explain to investors a big future. You got to be able to tell a big future story. These are generally companies that have no comps because it's a new industry. You know, there's no company like Skills. There's no company like DraftKings. So you put out those long-term projections, which we think is fine because there's no requirement that these analysts believe it. They can, we can then bring the CFO in, have a confidential meeting. We can have two meetings. We can have three meetings. We can, they can spend all the time they want. If they say to the CFO, hey, we're not buying it. At least they can do the work. You need to give it the time and the work for these analysts and these uh, buy-side investors to understand these companies and new businesses. It's its actually a service to them. Now it's been abused, which is what I think Eli is getting to. And I and I, I think this may be an area the SEC is gonna to wanna to inquire. I love the fact, I really do guys, I love the fact that earlier stage companies, this is the good, earlier stage companies that public investors do not have access to are suddenly being accessed, right? And some of them are good, some of them are great, and some are probably pretty not so great. And the question that really boils down to, because I think the mature businesses are easier, easier to project, both near term and longer term. The problem is where's the line of what's too early, right? Is it, I don't think it's too early to have a, a pre-earnings, I mean pre-EBITDA company, right? Facebook was that and, and uh, sorry, and Amazon was that for years and years until they weren't, right? But pre-revenue companies? I'm not sure should public investors be investing in that. What about pre-product companies where there are companies that don't have a product that's necessarily on the street? So I, I think it's about the types of companies, not necessarily specifically the projections, but what really is too early for public markets to invest. Yeah, and it scares me that, that SPACs are being associated with all those pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-everything. You know, it, it, it makes us nervous. I mean. If somebody, if somebody came to us with a company that absolutely had the cure for, for prostate cancer and the FDA was going to approve it the next day and it was pre-revenue, okay, sure. But it would take something like that for us to go into a pre-revenue company. We just we're, Maybe we've been around too long. We're, we've seen where those failures are. And the speculation that's going on that's creating you know, those companies, it's fine for guys like you. To say, hey, you know what, we we're going to get in some stocks that may not be, you know, for the faint of heart, 
right? DraftKings. We always thought that was the case. I don't know when California is going to have sports betting, but a year and a half ago, there was a rumor California's has sports betting. Stock goes up 15%. When California doesn't have sports betting, it goes down 20%. You guys understand that. I don't know that the Reddit investors understand that. And that's the fact that the speculation is coming from those quarters that is a concern to us. With those yeah, stocks. I mean, it, I, I think like generally the idea of it's almost like an end around around accreditation rules and and you know the fact that you know as a retail investor you can't get into late stage venture because you know it's kind of like a, a gated community only the people who are richest are allowed to play yeah. uh and you know i'm more libertarian in my views where it's like i think it's you know if people can gamble on sports certainly they can they can you know <laughs> gamble positive sum on the market right and and so if if they're allowed to you know pour money into the lottery, shouldn't they be able to pour money into something that could, you know, capitalize a business that compounds over time? I think they should be allowed to do that. I think it's a free country um, and all of that. But it's a whole different subject to look at whether this degree of speculation, which is what it is, gambling and all that, is telling us, is that one of the signs that the market's looking at a top? Is it, you know, Right. When stocks are being driven up from, you know, GameStop from 20 to 500. There may there just may be something wrong. And by the way, you know, if, if these investors, if they're following ARK, if they're saying, you know, we're buying this stock because ARK bought the stock. OK, fine. There's great accountability. If those stocks die, ARK gets punished. You don't pick up money in the future. You lose your reputation. There's a real credibility thing. It, but the people that are not doing it because for any reason, I buy the people that are following ARK. I don't buy the people that are following wallstreetbets.com because they think, you know, they're creating some revolution against Wall Street. You know, that's- But even, I mean, I think, yes, you can, you can obviously look at parts of the capital market and identify misbehavior and it's within SPACs and it's outside of SPACs. I think that's kind of where we are in the cycle where you have enough evidence that you could two years in the future look back and say, oh, it was so obvious. Didn't we recognize that this was going on? Well, I, I mentioned to you in 99, I said, look, this is starting to feel like 99. What happened in 99? You guys are too young. But what happened in 99 is any IPO that had tech or E in front of it or, or anything in the Internet that, you know, the stock would come at 20. The first trade would be at 100 to go to 200. And a year later, it was $1.50. I mentioned to you guys that you know a friend of mine, Capital Group, uh, at the time was asked to do in 202 an analysis of all those tech companies, and Morgan Stanley presented all of their you know tech and it was everybody else as well, and the average stock in 202 that had gone public in 99 was down 92 percent. So when I say it's starting to feel like 99 a little bit because I was there, what I mean is that the degree of speculation and as you want to you want to call it gambling or anything else in the market it's fine if it's there but if it's 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the trades got to be concerning it was got to look like something this is something's going to have to give yeah i mean i think there's a two a couple of nested things going on one is uh retail access to options is much more accessible than it used to be and so it allows them to make leverage bets not on like the way in which we underwrite positions is over a five-year period Right. Uh, if you're using options, you, you're like mechanically compressing your time horizon over which you can have the investment be recognized uh, in exchange for leverage against that. It results at least in more vol. In, in, but why in are the they market. buying it? But are they buying it because they know something about the company or are they buying it because they, you know, they want to do some betting and they can't get any return from debt instruments and they can't buy Tesla at 900. And so they're going to th this is all that's left to them. That's a yeah. concern, too. The other thing, late in 99, right, companies were forming specifically to IPO almost immediately. So we're not yet, I haven't yet seen the company that incorporates and then, you know, merges into a SPAC like a month later yet. Yeah, it, it's, so, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not, um, it's getting close. But in, by the <laughs> way, and, that, and that's where they will end up, though. That's the problem. Those kind of companies will end up merging into a SPAC because it's so much faster. Look, it's not, I don't believe it's 99. I think there's a lot of reasons it's not 99. All I'm saying is that the degree of speculation we're seeing in SPAC shares trading up just on the fact that it's it's been, you know, it's trading pipe shares trading up just on the basis there's over demand for it. All the Reddit and WallStreet.com betting, all the retail interest in the SPAC stocks from people that don't really know. By the way, when, when we have to do a proxy and close a deal, we can't even find these people to vote. 
The DraftKings stock was trading at 16 or 15. If the deal doesn't close, everybody gets 10 bucks. That's what they get. It's in everybody's interest to vote to get the deal done, even if they want to sell it. We couldn't find them. We couldn't find these retail investors to tell them there was a proxy that they had a vote. Remember that, Eli? I do know that. And I think that we had an easier time of it from other companies that have had postponed their shareholder votes and they're closing multiple different times because they can't get the vote together because it's all retail. I mean, we on were, a stock that's trading up on a stock, a stock that was doesn't. trading at multiple times, uh, you know, cash basis. But Brent, I think what we're getting at is, I think that the, the speculation, I think, is much more general. It's not just SPACs. But if you want to think about speculation and SPACs, I think the intersection is really kind of two, two, two things at the same time, which is that one, SPACs broke through. They have this ability to project forward, which right has, is the good and the bad that we've all discussed over the last 10 minutes. And I think that that's here and that innovation happened last year concurrently almost exactly with that, with the hit, with COVID hitting is that you get this run mostly fueled by retail with speculative retail kind of unaware investors who like certain topics or themes or threads, especially electric vehicles, which apparently everybody in the world loves. And I think it's those two things happening at the same time that is making the, the SPAC phenomenon feel really kind of retail heavy and especially speculative. So I think, I think it's that convergence that's really creating the issue. Can, can we talk about this on that topic like, you know, maybe just a good segue into that leakage issue. Um, how, how did this all happen, right? Who is leaking this? You know, it, it, how did it originate? And maybe we can talk about uh, Churchill as a more extreme example, what happened there. What's your guys' view on that? And, and you know, should it happen, should it not? It's terrible. It, it's, it's, it's I, I would like to use the F word. It's F and terrible uh, that, you know, it, it's no good for anybody. And it's, it's no good. It was no good for Michael Klein. I was just waiting for Lucid Motors when Klein stock, when Churchill was trading at 20, 30, 40, 50 to say, gosh, the market thinks we're worth five times as much. So whatever deal or handshake we have, we don't have a deal because if it was a deal, it would have to be announced. We want a higher deal. How could that be good for Michael Klein? They ended up having to you know, raise the price of the pipe. And the thing has come down to earth. But, you know, like GameStop or like AMC that are trading at some crazy number, having the Churchill SPAC trading at a crazy number, it can't be good for anybody. Now, the SEC for sure is going to look into these leaks. And this is the one real advantage that Regular Way has against SPAC that needs to be fixed. And that is that if you're out selling a pipe and it leaks out on a SPAC, people can actually buy a stock. Whereas, so what? Something leaks out on an IPO. There's nothing to buy. So that will be addressed and should be addressed. I'll tell you guys a little story from, from ourselves is that in, uh, you know, this was in Flying Eagle, so our last pack is in approximately, I don't know, summer. So last summer sometime, 2020. And I was doing a panel on Bloomberg, I think it was, um, you know, with NASDAQ representative Goldman Sachs, et cetera. And it was a, it was a panel on SPACs. And I don't even remember the specific topic. And I think that there was a couple thousand participants, right? And it's all, this is all, by the way, it's all virtual, it's all on Zoom. So I'm sitting in my little temporary office because I'm not going to my real office. And you know, the, they left on the chat box on Zoom thinking like there wasn't gonna be a lot of chat going on. During this, this panel, there was apparently hundreds of live chats going to the moderator and to me, all asking about a rumor was that, that was out there on us acquiring a company that we didn't even acquire. And, it was so overwhelming to the moderator because they weren't asking technical questions. They didn't want to know anything. All they wanted to know was the rumor true that we were going to acquire this company. And finally, the moderator, you know, who works for IPO Edge, finally said, all right, Eli, I've had enough. They're, they're making me nuts. There's a rumor out there. Do you care to comment on that rumor? And I think I said something to the effect that, of course, that's why I'm in this panel to just go and announce our next transaction and confirm the rumor. But that's what's going on. That's, and by the way, that was last summer. Fast forward to now, like Harry said, the rumors are much bigger. It's on Reddit. It's on who knows if it's on Instagram. I don't know where they are, but it's there's so much fuel to that, you know, in a way like GameStop, you know, it, not dissimilar similar to GameStop. And that is a bad thing. And, and the SEC is going to have to focus on that. And they should. So the SEC clearly will focus on basically material non-public information leaking out of the pipe presentations and affecting the price of the stocks. What other areas do you think that the SEC will or should be looking at in terms of kind of problems with SPACs and, yeah, and the way the, that they're set up. The, the, the area that I'm afraid they're going to have to look at 
which actually has a good purpose to it, is the longer-term projections. The liability that you have for making longer-term projections during the SPAC process versus the IPO process. It's great that growth companies can get a valuation that brings them into the public markets based on the company telling you what they think about the business at maturity. In the DraftKings Roadshow, there was no other way for us to do it but to show our view of how long it would take for 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the country to have sports betting. That would tell you how the stock's going to perform. You guys have done that work. And guidance from the company is really important because we've got people in every single state and we can tell you nothing's going to happen in Texas till 23. So if you put Texas in, you're making a mistake. Well, being able to do that long-term model was absolutely necessary to getting DraftKings public. The same thing for companies that don't have comps. The more you can do, and again, as I said, I think it's fine because not only do you get to show the long-term projections, but you can bring the CFO in and he can justify it. And if the investor says, you know, this guy's full of don't buy the stock. It's a good process. But that is definitely a process that the SEC will want to look at. Um, and whether or not they, you know, change the rules, although there may be legal issues, permitting a little more um, leeway within the public companies and the regular way IPO. I don't know how they're going to deal with it, but I hope they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there have been a lot of terrific stocks where this well, is going to benefit. Yeah, I will say, having looked at a number of investor decks from SPACs and then crossed back to the S4 that has the underlying, the real, like, you know, financial health of the business, there is some dressing up of the information, particularly the historical information that feels offsides to me to some degree and and so that, and that, that shouldn't be yeah yeah the projections being presented if you actually get the full time series of the projection as it's presented requires a lot more explanation than on its face is being provided for why they're making the projection is one way yeah to it's just it. a deck yeah if all you're looking at is a deck yeah well yeah. that's i mean that's you know that's why it's important i mean this goes back to the the leaks right and, and the rumors is that for particularly you know unsophisticated non institutional investors Right, they shouldn't have access, or they shouldn't know, or they shouldn't buy a stock based on, you know, either even if they had the deck by itself, they should have the deck plus that S four that has a more fulsome disclosure, and so they had enough information. Now, I don't know whether or not retail investors are going to go and read that seven hundred page document that obviously you do, Brett, but and I'm suspecting not, but at least that the availability of information, you know, is there, and so it goes back to the league thing. You shouldn't be just investing on a. 10 to 15 to 20 page deck that's absurd, right? The key is, especially you want to protect investors as does the SEC, as do we, that you should have you know, the whole package in front of you. So I, I, think, I think it's really important. But you, 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 the question you asked is what's the SEC gonna look into? We were editorializing, we were trying to you know, justify why it exists and why at least in the two that we've done, DraftKings and Skills, it made sense. It doesn't always make sense and it certainly, you know, could be an issue for retail investors and for, you know, these blogs that just look at a page from the, you know, from the deck and, and put that out. But, I mean, wouldn't you agree that it is an area that the SEC will want to look at? It seems likely. For us, it's like part of our due diligence. It's, it's almost like I don't trust the companies to make the projections anyway over the medium term because I think we have a better read on where technology is going sometimes. And so then for the mechanics of how they're operating the business, it's important. You know, we have extremely aggressive electric vehicle projections relative to others. And then tying those back to some of the investor projections presented by EV SPACs, they actually are offsides relative to our expectations for the market as a whole and profitability of the market as a whole. And so it's, you know, in some ways, if I believe that it were a good faith effort, you know, then then it could be useful material for me to underwrite and say, oh, this is what the business should be worth. I think there is so much spin being put on the ball. It's almost like well, from, from have, our perspective, right. noise. So and the, and the good news, but the bad news, if it's only you, is you have access to the CFO. You guys in the, in the two cases we're aware of, you spent considerable time with the CFO going through what's behind all of those numbers. Right. Which regular way IPO, you can't do that. Regular way IPO, you know, they come in and they see on, on Tuesday, you get 45 minutes, and then you get back in that black car roadshow. And Thursday at four o'clock, you have to show your cards. You have to put in your order. 
So, you know, again, you can look at all of that. You can meet with a CFO. You can be skeptical. You can tell them, you know, look, we just think you're full of shit with your projections and you don't buy the stock. The retail investor may not have that advantage. So where is this all going to go? Where is it? What's the five years from now? Are SPACs still going to be a thing? Is this going to be like there's going to be, I don't know, 7,000 SPACs instead of 700? <laughs> um, or, or is this kind of like an epidemic the, of this part the model, of the capital yes. market? <laughs> I, look, Eli can, can go next. I've been doing all the talking. Yes, I do not think that SPACs are a bubble. I've seen bubbles. I think SPACs are for real. I think they make a lot of sense. I do think that some of the advantages that SPACs have that we've been discussing versus regular way, you know, the gap will be closed to some extent. And some of the advantages that regular way has over SPACs, which we haven't got into much, SPACs may be able to close those gaps. I believe SPACs are here to stay. They have been. They've had better times and worse times, but they have been. I don't think it's a SPAC bubble. I think there's a concern that the whole market is getting toward the top, as I've mentioned to you, because of all the kinds of speculation. And all of these SPACs and the companies that are using SPACs to go public are maybe part of that bigger problem with too much speculation. So it's a symptom rather than, you know, the disease in itself. But then, so are there going to be 7,000 SPACs? This is, this is my question. No. Like there, there must be. Eli, what's your How many, I mean, how many, remember, SPACs have two years. Uh, how many IPOs are there every year? I don't even know if there's room. Well, I think the better question is how many operating businesses exist in the world? And then we can back into how many SPACs there actually might be. <laughs> I mean, I say that, I say that in jest, but I think that we're, you know, right now we're in, a speculation bubble, but the speculation is on the part of the sponsors, right? The sponsors are putting up real at-risk money. So they're putting up five to 12 or more million dollars, which is real money uh, for a sponsor to go and raise one of these SPACs to go and find a target, right? And they're taking it extremely seriously, but they want to find the next Virgin Galactic. They want to find the next DraftKings, right? And I think that right now the speculation is probably more on their side than anywhere else. And I do think at a certain period of time, we're going to see an inflection point where the number of SPACs bidding on or competing for a finite amount of really good public company quality businesses is going to kind of hit, hit a wall. And I think that's gonna start shaking out um, you know, these new first time sponsors from you know, fi funding their first SPAC because I think it's gonna to get tougher and tougher and it's gonna slow down. And so that curve that you were talking about that's gonna turn into 7,000 SPACs is gonna, gonna slow down. But the question is, what's going to happen to the four or 500 that are out there right now? I think Harry said earlier, there's $150 billion worth of SPAC paper out there. And by the way, that's, that's mostly okay. Like, what does it matter? The SPAC sponsors are the one taking risk, um, as long as the investors are, are not getting hurt. And right, so a SPAC sponsor may find a business, and what's the worst thing that happen? They don't get a deal done. So what? The money goes back to investors. Um, so that's why I agree with Harry that I, I don't think it's a bubble. I think that there's a lot of sponsors running around trying to find a big deal and do the next DraftKings, but that's okay so long as you know all the things we've talked about for the last you know hour, you know are protected from an investor standpoint. So, so keying on that for just a second, Brett, my pre my prediction to be more specific because I, I see you wanted us to be a little more specific is there won't be seven thousand, there won't be seven hundred, there won't even be the five hundred eighty six there are now. I'll tell you why. There's not enough companies to take public. So what happens is if a company is rumored to be interested in going public with a SPAC, there's a SPAC off. And most of these SPACs, of the 586, 584 of them are less than a billion dollars. That's why we did the billion seven. We want to differentiate ourselves. So most of them are 250 to 500. They can do the size deals that are being done, one to $5 billion valuations, and 10 of them will show up. And the 10 of them will show up to the board to propose it be their SPAC are selected by a bank who does a SPAC off where they look at 200 of them and they pick 10 to go pitch. Of the 10 that go pitch, probably 10 out of 10 are first timers because of the 586, 540 of them are first timers. And if they don't get a deal done, they'll never get another SPAC. So what we like to say is they end up having to take down their pants, excuse my language, on their promote, on their founder shares. And many times they do a deal like we did two or three SPACs ago where we took zero up front. Everything was an earn out. And then these SPAC sponsors are gonna say, gosh, we thought that this you know, SPAC business was gonna be a great pig out for us, and it's not. 
We might as well go back to our hedge funds. We might as well go back to private equity. We might as well go back to earning a living honestly like you guys do, you know, with public equity. So I think that the most of them are not going to get a deal. Those who do get a deal are going to find out it's not the panacea you think. And then, of course, the correction that's coming in the market will destroy the credibility of SPAC sponsors who overpaid and took a stock out. It's now trading at seven. So you put the stocks trading at seven together with people who don't find a deal compared to the people who don't want to do another one because they lose money when, when they do find a deal. You put all that together, I'm going to say there'll be one to 200 of them, not 7,000, not 700. And of the one to 200, there'll probably be two or three in each of 10 categories that you guys will even take the calls from. I think one of the one of the criticism around SPAC has been one is opacity, but associated with that, the amount of fees being charged throughout each of the, the stages. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I think earlier on, you, you mentioned the the first round historically has been ARBs and hedge funds, right? Where do they get the ARBing opportunity from, right? And then, then talk about the, the founder fees. They, they sell the warrant and keep the stock or they keep the stock, uh, keep the warrant and sell the stock or they hedge this or that. The other, I mean, there's all kinds of strategies, but that leads me to the biggest problem of all. I hadn't forgot, I forgot about it. Why these SPACs are going to trade down. The banks are making incredible liquidity available to these SPAC funds. So you, you, you see these guys with three or four or five billion dollar AUM hedge funds and they show up and they say, hey, we got a billion dollar SPAC fund. Well, how do they have a billion dollar SPAC fund? They have a billion dollar SPAC fund because the banks will lend them 80 or 90 percent. Why? because they know they can force them to redeem and get their money back. So for 100 or $200 million of equity, you've got a billion dollar SPAC fund. So you put 50 million into 20 SPACs. But guess what? Unless you wanna put in more equity, you have to redeem at the closing or you have to sell it to be able to not have to put in more capital, right? Because you're not getting 80 or 90% on a margin. You may not even be able to margin some of these stocks. Maybe you get 40 or 50%. So when deals are getting announced, which they are now, it's natural to see SPAC stocks going down, SPACs themselves, because people have to sell out so that they can stay in a deal if they want to stay in a deal. Does that make sense? So that's also going on right now. So it's leverage, the arbing opportunity between shorting the stock, selling the warrant, keeping the stock, keeping the warrant, selling the stock, all of those games. Yeah, I was just going to say, what does that what does that mean for you know investors and real holders of companies, right? Where this kind of leverage issue that Terry's describing is there. What it means is because there's more pressure, right, on these hedge fund types who are using leverage to enter into these spacs. It means that the spac sponsors, the company that's going public, are going to have to move all those shares, you know, to institutional longer term investor hands. So there's more pressure to find the right investors for the stock. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing, getting rid of these hedge fund vultures, right? Who are just trying to arb or take positions or ride momentum, like clear them out, but, the, and, and that's good. But the bad part is, or the pressure is, you've got to find the stock, you got to migrate that stock to the right hands, right? So that's another pressure on the process. See, Brett, we're giving you all the secrets because we know you don't play any of those games, <laughs> right? Well, in, in some ways they're they're like, I don't know. Yeah, we, we are interested in a different time horizon and a different, way to look at the world. Within equity markets in general, there is uh, so much business misalignment between like, or, or operational reasons why people focus on the short term. And, and, and you get all kinds of pressure put on you to focus on the short term from clients, from uh, you know, capital markets participants, from everything. But equity is an infinite duration instrument, right? Like, so if I, an individual investor, am investing in any equity, it makes no sense to me that I would then pay attention to what that equity does over the next three months. That should be a long duration investment that I'm making. Uh, and, and, you know, and so that's kind of like where we try to play the game as opposed to, we're going to try to maximize IRR over three months. That's just not yeah, look, the inefficiency can, that we try to exploit. If, if, like if you call us because of who you are and you want an allocation, you will probably get it. You're important to us. That's why we're here for an hour and a half on this podcast. Like you guys matter. You're important in the world. You're an important relationship. So you're probably going to get filled with SPAC stock and there's going to be a warrant and you can sell the warrant right away at a profit and keep the stock or vice versa. 
it's available to be done. The SPAC actually is a good deal for the buyer. It gets complicated, though, when you're buying with this leverage, as I just mentioned, and it gets complicated when the retail investors come in and buy the SPAC that they know nothing whatsoever about it. I think generally, like businesses do better with shareholders that are focused on the longer term. Like they are better managed when that's how they're managed. And a lot of the tech companies that have been successful have managed to do so by extracting themselves from the pressure that kind of operators can put on them to, to, to do something over the next six or 12 months. Yeah, the good ones want to have the long only funds who are in it for a long time be in their shareholder base. That is our job on every single SPAC. From the day we start raising the SPAC, we want to get the mix of ARBs, hedge fund versus long only guys in the SPAC to be the northern end of that. If, the, if all of it could be long only guys who think that way, we would sell the entire SPAC. They get filled. The hedge funds get filled next. And yeah, some ARBs get filled who we know are going to keep the warrant, sell the stock. Why? Because that permits mutual funds who aren't allowed to buy SPACs to be able to buy you know, once, they're, once it's listed and traded. So that's our goal up front. And then once you take the company public, that's why we had to announce it. That's why we had 150 investor meetings on skills. We announced the, um, when we announced the deal, we said there was a pipe. The pipe had Fidelity, Newberger, Franklin Fund, and uh, Wellington. That's a good start in getting into long only hands. And then so people see that, and maybe that attracts T. Rowe. Maybe that attracts Capital Group. That's the job. Maybe it attracts ARC. Obviously, these companies, these growth companies, want investors that are going to be long term because their stories are long term and it can be a bumpy road. Yeah. Well, this has been like hugely educational and really appreciate you all taking the time. Uh, and uh, best of luck in your ongoing business as a gig economy IPO banker. I think you'll. He'll do great. <laughs> I, I, I think before Uber. we go, That's before helpful. before we go, I have to. Uh, we have to make uh, make it clear that there is a um, SPAC out there with our name, but that is not affiliated with us at all. Uh, ARKI, I believe it's uh, Jeffrey's uh, uh, SPAC, and it's got all the written language very similar to um, the ARK ETF funds. So just wanted to throw it out there. I think this is one of those um, behaviors that's associated with the opacity that we're seeing in the SPAC markets. We've gotten a lot of questions around, uh, you know, if, if this is an ARC uh, SPAC vehicle, but it's not. We, we, we don't, we're not in the SPAC sponsorship business. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, just wanted to make that clear. Look, and if someone is trying to confuse investors, which is what it is, look, Newberger isn't going to get confused. They're not going to buy this thinking it's you and Kathy's uh, a SPAC, and neither is Capital Group. But the retail investors and some of the ARBs and all that, they may actually be confused enough to buy it. And look, this is the kind of thing, again, you see that makes you think there's a top out there. It, yeah. It's pure speculation, and particularly pure speculation without with even knowing who's really behind the SPAC. Right. It's, it's very consistent with the theme that we are feeling you know, way too much speculation. Yeah. Well, on that chat, sour note, thank you much for joining us. Uh, <laughs> we will see. I, well, I, I agree there's sold. not going to be 7,000 SPACs, but, and, and there should be a shakeout here, I think. And, and hopefully the responsible operators will end up, you know, being able to, to continue to do good business for, for companies that need it. I mean, I think that's ultimate, like there are businesses that this vehicle makes sense for. And, um, you know, to the degree that that alignment remains, I think that it's a healthy part of the capital markets. Uh, Look, and after we've pointed out all these speculative things and everything wrong with SPACs and all that, the pressure that we're now putting on ourselves to say, you know, gosh, look at how much we know and look at how much we've learned and look at how smart we are. The pressure we're now putting on ourselves to, to follow skills and follow DraftKings with an equally good deal is incredible. And I think that's important, though, that we feel that responsibility and being able to discuss what's wrong with the market and how to try to make it better and putting ourselves in that position does put some weight on us that we take seriously. So thank you for giving us a chance to talk about it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for being with us.
Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.